Welcome to this video lecture on personality assessment. To begin with, we're going to explore the origins of personality assessment. It's important when you first learn about personality assessment to understand the difference between objective measures and subjective measures of personality assessment. Most personality assessments are grouped into one of these two camps. The majority of this video lecture is going to be focused on objective measures of personality assessment and an objective measure is a standardized psychometric instrument in which you ask the same questions in the same order to every test taker, usually paper or pencil or computer based. An example of this is the assessment that we're going to be exploring in most depth today, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory or MMPI. In contrast, subjective measures of personality assessment are less standardized and include both structured interviews, clinical interviews, and also include projective personality assessment. And an example of a projective personality assessment would be the Rorschach Comprehensive System. At the thematic apperception test is another one. We will be exploring those kinds of assessments more at another time. Most of what we're going to focus on today is objective personality assessment. So I mentioned the main inventory we're going to explore in depth today is the MMPI and the other inventories explored or mentioned I should say are the Milan Instruments, the Personality Assessment Inventory, the California Psychological Inventory, the Tennessee Self-Concept Scale and its version for children the Piers Harris, the Five Factor Tests and the Myers-Briggs which we're going to briefly mention mostly you're going to learn about that more in a career development or career counseling class because the majority of the time that we use the Myers-Briggs and counselors do use it quite frequently is in career settings. The main goal for the majority of objective personality assessment is to identify either psychopathology or personality types. Most of these are norm referenced assessments. What do we mean by that? your score is compared with a norm group which is meant to represent the population let's say of the United States. Clinical significance is determined at usually being two standard deviations from the mean so this would be a t-score of at least 70. I will add that the MMPI has slightly different cutoffs so in the MMPI a t-score of 65 is clinical significance for whatever reason. But, but regardless, the way that they get to that is through comparing your score with the norm group and what is essentially the normal distribution for that norm group. They take two standard deviations from the average and that's what qualifies as clinical significance. In other words, an unusual reporting, something that is less than 5% likely to happen by chance alone. Because if you remember, two standard deviations less than or more than the mean constitute 95% of responders typically in the normal distribution. So we've talked a little bit about what objective personality assessment is. It's time for us to ex understand a bit better how personality assessment has developed. The very first personality inventory was the personal data sheet. This was created in 1917 it, during the First World War to diagnose neuroticism early in soldiers who were returning home with shell shock. Shell shock, of course, is now called post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. So the personal data sheet was first devised and developed to help identify early PTSD in World War I soldiers. Those ideas from the personal data sheet were expounded upon at the University of Minnesota to create the MMPI in 1943 which became the most popular psychological test in the United States. What they found at the University of Minnesota was that before the MMPI, existing psychological assessments were no more than educated guesses. In essence, developers, for example of the personal data sheet, had imagined what constituted psychopathology and what did not. And these imaginations, these assumptions, were often inaccurate. So here are two examples of question items from the personal data sheet to illustrate this. One is, are you critical of others? Another is, do you daydream frequently? What the 
researchers at the University of Minnesota found was that actually mentally healthy or well people were more likely to endorse these items than people with neurosis or psychosis. In other words, they did not differentiate what we would call more normal from abnormal or healthy from psychopathological. And so these tests were actually less useful because they weren't always accurate in identifying who actually had a mental disorder and who did not. The MMPI was created for this purpose in order to be a more rigorous scientifically based instrument that would help to differentiate normal from abnormal, healthy from psychopathological. The way that they developed the MMPI was to review existing case studies and to consult with professionals first. This is known as content validity. The MMPI, of course, though, is also a more of a scientifically based test. It's standardized, it's norm referenced. And how did they do this? What's, wh who were the norm groups, for example? Well, it'll be interesting for you to learn about the normal versus psychiatric samples in the first MMPI, and we'll be learning about that in just a moment. So essentially, the MMPI involved comparing an individual scores with the norm groups and then determining from the norm group what was normal and what was deviant or abnormal. The MMPI was the first psychometric instrument to use large samples. This was novel at the time. As you'll see, there was about a thousand people who were surveyed in the first MMPI, and that was unusual. It was really, in, in many ways, the beginnings of major psychometric approaches to personality assessments in the United States and in the world in general. So I've talked about how the norm groups are kind of interesting. In the very first version of the MMPI, there were two groups, a more normal or typical group, and then a more psychopathological group. Well, who was involved in both these groups? The norm group, back in the 1940s, contained 724, and this was their term, normals, from Minnesota, mostly rural, working-class, white Protestants of Scandinavian heritage, almost all of whom were married. Their average education level was 8th grade, and their age range was 16 through 55. Now, as you can see, this population is not wholly representative of the U.S. population in general. It's a slice of a very specific regional uh, pocket of a population in the United States. And so that biases the results to some extent, because if you're being compared with this norm group who is meant to be normal, then there are specific things that you're being evaluated against. One would be, for example, a sense of hardiness, a sense of uh, being very community oriented, because if you live in a very cold region such as Minnesota, you have to band together during cold months in order to stave off freezing and, and you know, cope with that kind of weather. So uh, you can see there from the pictures that gives you kind of an idea of what this norm group might have been like and um, why that, that's, there's a little bit of bias interjected here. It's important to understand as we review how psychometric instruments such as the MMPI evolved over time. Initially, its norm groups were a bit spurious, if you will, a bit lacking. There was a second norm group, and these were 221 pure cases of the following diagnostic groups at the University of Minnesota inpatient facility. So essentially, there was the Minnesota normals, as they're called, and there was this inpatient group. These patients had what we call pure cases of the following problems. Now, what do we mean by pure? Pure in that they only had this one diagnosis. So if they had multiple diagnoses, they were excluded from the, the group because they just wanted pure cases. Hypochondria was one of them. Depression was another. Hysteria was another. This is now called histrionic personality disorder. Psychopathic deviance was another. This is now called antisocial personality disorder paranoia, psychasthenia, now called OCD, schizophrenia, and hypomania and bipolar disorder. So they essentially gathered together uh, groups of these different psychopathological variables and wanted to see what their responses were on question items compared to the Minnesota normals. <laughs> 
how did they come up with their scales? How did they come up with the items that they were going to use, the questions in the MMPI? They selected, the researchers at the University of Minnesota, selected an item for a scale, a subscale, if the psychiatric group scored higher than the normals or rated themselves higher. For example, much of the time my head seems to hurt all over. This is a item from the hypochondriasis, a hypochondria, a subscale. This was endorsed by 4% of normals compared to 12% from the hypochondriasis group. So in other words, there is a difference that's clinically significant, that was found to be clinically significant, or statistically significant, I should say, between the two groups. And then, therefore, that item was retained because it differentiated from normal and abnormal. Now, that's one item. Essentially what the MMPI does is it takes a bunch of items, so you have 12 to 15 items in a subscale, for example, for each of those subscales, so hypochondriasis has 12 to 15, depression has 12 to 15, and you add up the totals, they're true-false questions, and if you say, uh, indicate in the positive direction that you do have those symptoms for 12 of those 15, then you're more likely to be in the abnormal range, more, look more like the psychiatric group than you are the Minnesota normals. The MMPI used the criterion keying method to add up these scores, to add up the items um, for each of the domains uh, in terms of whether or not the person was saying, yes, I feel depressed or not. Unlike prior tests, the items didn't necessarily have what we call face validity. What is face validity? Remember, that's similar to eyeball validity. So when you look at a question item, you know what it's asking. An example would be, if a question item said, I feel sad many times, that question is asking you about sadness. It's pretty, you know, has face validity for sadness. Anyway, the MMPI didn't always have that. Uh, didn't al wasn't always obvious what it was asking you. Well, why is this? Well, it's because it increases the overall validity when it's not always possible to know what an item is measuring because it's much easier to fake out a test if you know what exactly what it's asking you than if you don't know what it's asking you. Because of this lack of face validity, some of the original questions are strange by today's standard. I'll add something very important as a qualifier, which is, so you have these questions where you don't know completely what it's asking you, as you'll come to see in just a moment when I read the questions. But in addition to that, every personality test, psychological test, is culturally encapsulated, meaning in 20, 30 years from now, the tests that we're using today are going to be outdated because culture changes, because the human race and its behaviors change. And so what we now, today, see as being deviant or what we see as being an, a cultural experience worth talking about or what worth including as part of a question isn't going to be that relevant 20 or 30 years from now. Here's an example for you just to kind of elucidate this a bit. We may well, if we were creating a personality inventory today, uh, talk about, you know, I would much prefer to be on social media than interact with friends face to face. That would tell you something about how introverted someone is or their degree of social skills, for example. Now, 20 or 30 years from now, we may not even know what social media is, or it may be completely different, or we're all living in virtual reality. I mean, who knows? But what I mean by that is just to th understand that everything is culturally encapsulated. The MMPI is no different. The first edition, as you'll come to see when we read these items, is quite encapsulated, and they actually revised a lot of the items uh, in the update that we'll talk about in a moment in 1989. So here are the original items. I think you'll find them interesting. I believe there is a devil and a hell in the afterlife. Everything is turning out just like the prophets of the Bible said it would. I think I would like to belong to a motorcycle club. Often I feel as if there were a tight band around my head. Women should not be allowed to drink in cocktail bars. If the money were right... I would like to work for a circus or a carnival. There is something wrong with my sex organs. I have never had black, tarry-looking bowel movements. I have had no difficulty starting or holding my urine. 
Now, as I mentioned, a lot of these are you know, not as relevant culturally today. For example, belonging to a motorcycle club doesn't mean the same it does today as it did in the 1940s. Same with going off and joining a circus. It meant something different in the 1940s. In addition to that, even in the 1940s, some of these questions, you're not entirely sure what it's asking you. Um, and that's a benefit, a plus of the MMPI, because you're less likely to fake out the test. There were 566 items that were selected for the original MMPI, and some of these had special significance. They're called critical items. What do we mean by this? Well, let's say you have a subscale for, let's pick depression. So you have 12 to 15 questions in that subscale for depression. One of those might be really important to look at, regardless of whether the person endorsed 10, 11 of the other items. So if they just endorsed one item, and endorse no other depression items, still that one item is important. Okay, Here's a couple of examples of this. One is from the depression subscale that says, I sometimes wish I were dead. Obviously that's tapping into suicidality, and so regardless of how depressed a person reports, it's still uh, uh, something that you want to follow up on in the clinical interview when you're reviewing the results as to why the person endorsed that item. The next two are about psychosis, so regardless of whether a, person, uh, a person's profile indicates schizophrenia or not, it's worth following up about these two. Evil spirits possess me at times, and I hear voices outside of my head. Now you may think, well, how on earth can you say yes to those and not have a schizophrenia profile? Well, as you'll come to see if you've taken a diagnosis class, or will take one, um, that people can hear voices and not experience things like schizophrenia. For example, they can hear voices as part of a depressive episode. So those are still very important pieces of information to, uh, to know about because that informs treatment planning. If a person has psychosis, they may, may need medication, for example, in addition to whatever tr treatment they're getting for things like depression. I had mentioned that in 1989, the MMPI was revised to 567 items. It was renormed on, again, a large sample, over a thousand men, over a thousand women. And now here's the kicker. This is why the development of the MMPI is very important for us to understand, because it really helps us understand the development of personality assessment in general. Instead of picking this strange norm group, the Minnesota Normals, in 1989, the norm group was stratified to 1980 U.S. Census data. What does that mean, stratified? It means that if you have, let's say, 55% Caucasians in the U.S. population, okay, I'm just making up that figure, 55, but there's a percentage that exists for the number of Caucasians in the U.S. That number has to be represented in the norm group for the test. 55% can't be more, can't be less, has to be just the same. When you do that, your sample starts to look more and more like the U.S. population. So it's just a more valid comparison, if that makes sense. These people were drawn from six states, several military bases, and one Indian reservation. The second edition of the MMPI also added additional scales, and if you've read or, or watched video lectures on reliability, it has a decent retest reliability of 0.58 to 0.92. In 1992, a version was normed and revised for adolescents using the same method, so using, again, stratified sampling. And in 2011, they used the same stratified sample, could just retain the same norm group, didn't mess with it. What they did mess with was how they defined which items best represented those constructs or those subscales. So, for example, depression. They used a method called item response theory, or IRT. And IRT is very useful for determining, for example, how well does an item discriminate or differentiate between groups. So, for example, if you answer a question about sadness a particular way, how well does that predict whether or not you're depressed? And based on those predictions, the item is either retained in the subscale or it's discarded from the subscale. It's just a tighter way of getting the test together. And IRT is often used to reduce large tests to smaller numbers of questions. So the MMPI-2 is a good example of this. The revised form, the RF, uh, 
was 338 items versus 567. One of the main innovations of the MMPI was its inclusion of validity scales. Validity scales helped to detect when someone was inattentive or inconsistent or deliberately attempting to lie. We call this faking good or faking bad. This ability to evaluate for what we call impression management made the MMPI very appealing to clinicians and to forensic examiners because before this you could give someone a psychometric instrument and they could, you know, if they have, if the items have face validity, meaning you can look at them, you know what they're asking you, you can kind of fake it a bit. You can say, oh, I feel absolutely terribly depressed when that's not true because you, for example, want treatment um, or you just feel terrible in general and so depression, whatever it is, yes, I meet all the criteria. That's called a cry for help. Or you may completely say no to everything because you don't want to be uh, seen as someone who, um, you know, is, is, is psychopathological for whatever reason. It could be that you want to avoid um, court involvement or you want to avoid treatment in general if you're being, if you're going to a court and they're evaluating your mental status. So, being able to evaluate for impression management is very useful because it helps you know how valid the test is and how interpretable it is and that leads to whether or not you can use the test to make decisions. Here are the validity scales of the revised form of the second edition of the MMPI. There are three main areas for the validity scales. One is inconsistent reporting. The CNS scale is how many questions the person leaves unanswered. If there's more than, say, 15, I think it's 15 questions unanswered that the profile is invalid, you can interpret that test result. There is also the what's called the VRIN and the TRIN. Um, those are very important because essentially it helps to determine how attentive someone is being and how consistent they're being and how they respond to the test. The VRIN and TRIN scales have item pairs. So here's an example. I feel sad sometimes, I feel blue uh, every day, okay? Or I, I feel blue uh, uh, once in a while. So I, I feel sad sometimes, I feel blue once in a while. Both of those questions are very similar, okay? I feel sad sometimes, I feel blue once in a while. And if a person says yes to one and no to another, that's inconsistent responding. The trin is about, I believe it's the trend, is about flipping those around. So instead of saying, I feel sad, sometimes I feel blue once in a while, instead it becomes, I feel sad sometimes, and I do not feel blue once in a while. And if you say yes to one, yes to the other, that's inconsistent because you should be saying yes to one and then no to the other. Does that make sense? Because it's a double, the second is a double negative. I do not feel sad once in a while. So you should be saying, uh, no, in fact, I do feel sad once in a while. So again, those are kind of testing your attention, a test taker's attention, and their uh, uh, the degree to which they're, they're being consistent. Then we have over-reporting and under-reporting. Over-reporting, or what's called faking bad, is when you, essentially there's a cry for help involved. And here we look at infrequent responses. So these this, these are responses that even people with, with severe psychopathology say, no, I, I don't have that symptom. Or e people who have genuine medical issues say, no, I don't have that symptom. So if you indicate that, you're saying, I have symptoms uh, that most even people with genuine problems don't have, and that's over-reporting. We also have under-reporting or faking good. Those subscales are about question items that most people would say yes to, even people who are not psychopathological. So an example would be, I feel angry sometimes. Most of us feel angry sometimes. So if a person says no to that, then they're probably, and they do that consistently, they say no to these items where most people would say yes, even if they're not psychopathological. That person is trying to present a, a, a favorable impression of themselves. They're what's called faking good. Here's a funny graphic to uh, show you a little bit about f basically over-reporting for medical problems or, or somatic problems. 
I looked up my symptoms on the internet and I'm worried that I might be dead. Hypochondriasis, I guess. Okay, next, we're going to look at the more clinical scales of the MMPI. So, in other words, if the client gives you their test back, they've completed it, and you do the analysis, and the profile reveals that it's valid, meaning that the person hasn't underreported or overreported, they've been consistent in their test taking approach, then you can start interpreting the MMPI. And this is these what we see in front of us are some of the subscales <clears throat> that we look at when we're interpreting the MMPI. The first is emotional or internalizing dysfunction. So this is things like anxiety, depression. Then we have thought dysfunction. That's things like uh, having tangential thoughts, flight of ideas, also having perceptual disturbances that occurs in schizophrenia. Then we have behavioral or externalizing dysfunction. This is, for example, being very impulsive, being aggressive, uh, acting out, using drugs. So instead of having anxiety, depression, more internalizing, you have externalizing problems. Then we have demoralization. That's quite aligned to depression, as you might imagine, the loss of faith that things will change, loss of hope. Somatic complaints, that used to be called hypochondriasis. Again, that, that one has to do with um, imagining that you have medical problems when you don't. Low positive emotions used to be called the depression subscale. Cynicism, antisocial behavior, ideas of persecution, paranoia. Dysfunctional negative emotions, that one used to be called psychasthenia or OCD. Aberrant experiences, that used to be called the schizophrenia subscale. And hypermanic activation. You'll notice that RC5 is missing, and just briefly, it's important for me to mention historically that the first edition of the MMPI had a subscale that tapped into, they called it masculinity, femininity. Basically, what was your gender role identification, and uh, to what extent did you identify as being, or at least could you be identified as being, uh, leaning towards being gay or lesbian or bisexual. The reason they took that out of the MMPI, and I'm glad they did in 1989, was that in 1980, the DSM-3, which was newly implemented in 1980, had taken out homosexuality as a mental disorder. Before 1980, homosexuality existed as a mental disorder in the United States. And so that subscale was about, basically, the diagnosis of homosexuality, which, because of the society changing, importantly so, uh, we have now removed that as being one of the subscales of the MMPI. Okay, we're now looking at specific problems. So we've looked at kind of the big subscales uh, that we, the clinical scales we just saw. Now we have the somatic cognitive scales and the internalizing scales. In a moment, we'll also look at the externalizing subscales. Somatic cognitive, as you might imagine, has to do with physiological. Um, uh, symptoms and also what we call cognitive symptoms. Cognitive here meaning uh, a person having cognitive difficulty with thinking, difficulty with cognition, difficulty with memory, with consciousness, like you might find with, for example, early onset Alzheimer's, things like that, or brain injury. We have malaise, gastrointestinal issues, head pain, neurological, and cognitive complaints. Okay, internalizing asks about specific, uh, there's subscales that are about, sorry, suicidal ideation, helplessness, self-doubt, inefficacy. Inefficacy is uh, the feeling in, unable to accomplish goals or tasks. Stress or worry, anxiety, anger proneness, behavior restricting fears, that's also known as phobias, and multiple specific fears that's more generalized, such as generalized anxiety. The externalizing subscales look at juvenile conduct problems, substance abuse, aggression, and activation. Activation, we're talking about hypermanic activation, meaning high levels of energy and impulsivity. Interpersonal, we have things like family problems, interpersonal passivity, social avoidance, shyness, and what's called disaffiliativeness. That's the lack of identification with a social subgroup. 
Then we have the interest scales, and I don't know for the life of me why these were retained, if I'm honest. The MMPI includes these interesting uh, uh, assessments for aesthetic or literary interests versus mechanical and physical interests. It's just odd uh, to find in an instrument that is by and large focused on psychopathology rather than these kind of interests. Anyway, and there's the Psi 5 scales. The Psi 5 scales are important because those tap into some of the personality disorders. Aggressiveness that, uh, and disconstraint, those two uh, kind of correlate a little bit with cluster B personality disorders. Psychoticism is about cluster A personality disorders. And then negative emotionality or neuroticism is about the cluster C personality disorders. And then we also have the subscale for introversion and low positive emotionality. I'm not going to go through what exactly is, you know, every single code in this interpretation guide on the right hand side when it says MMPI 2 RF sources. But what I do want to mention is that this here uh, interpretation guide that you see is worth looking at and, and having as a reference when you're using the MMPI because let's say you're concerned about a client's thought dysfunction, let's say, you know the specific subscales to look at if you use this chart. Does that make sense? Or if you're interested in, let's say, whether or not the client was under-reporting or atten attempting to uh, fake good, then you would be looking at two subscales that are indicated on this table. I find it useful for interpretation to know what I'm looking for. This is one example of a, a score sheet, a score form um, that, that exists for the MMPI that's an official pro uh, Pearson product that you would use with the MMPI. And hopefully you'll get the ex and ex be able to experience actually graphing these results in class. You see in this uh, graph form that there are two horizontal lines in the graph. One is hard to see the numbers. One is at 65 and one is at 40. Or is it 50? No, it's at 50. So you have 65 and 50. Now, why is that relevant? Okay, well, 50, the lowest uh, uh, horizontal line, is the average. 50 is a T-score of 50. 65 is a T-score of 65, which is, remember, for the MMPI, clinically significant. So if you have, and we do see some of this if you look at the graph carefully, any scores that are above the second horizontal line, the top horizontal line, those scores are what we consider clinically significant because they're more than two uh, standard deviations or at least a T-score of 65, they're, they're more than that and so they're unlikely to happen by chance alone. So with the MMPI what you do is you count up the number of items, you write that on the score sheet, and then you find the number of items that correlates with that T-score, and that gives you a sense for which of those subscales is clinically significant. Here's an example or sample interpretation of a report that you could write using the MMPI-2 as a data source. I'm just going to read this for you because it'll give you a sense for how you, the MMPI can actually be quite useful. The patient's MMPI-2 profile is valid. Mr. Anderson approached the MMPI-2 in an honest and open manner, willing to admit his faults without being overly self-critical. His responses suggest a severe degree of psychiatric symptomology and general distress. Mr. Anderson's profile suggests that he experiences severe anxiety and emotional distress. Individuals with similar profiles feel chronically anxious tense and agitated. They tend to be shy and do not interact well socially. They may have unwanted and disturbing thoughts and often fear loss of emotional and cognitive control. Similar individuals feel overwhelmed by the responsibilities of daily life and may become confused, disorganized, and maladaptive under stress. Mr. Anderson's profile indicates that he experiences chronic feelings of depression. He tends to feel unhappy, helpless and pessimistic about the future. Individuals with similar profiles get little enjoyment out of life and lack energy for coping with the problems of their everyday lives. They tend to have poor self-esteem and feelings of self-deprecation and guilt, which may contribute to thoughts of suicide. 
similar individuals are likely to be given anxiety and depressive disorder diagnoses. So that gives you a sense for what would go into an interpretation. I just want to briefly mention that when you write up interpretations for psychological reports, you know, of psychological tests that you get back, you always interject a degree of caution in the interpretation. So in the second paragraph, it begins with, Mr. Anderson's profile suggests. That sentence stem is essentially indicating the reader that Mr. Anderson took a test and if his profile is true, meaning it's accurate to Mr. Anderson, these are problems that he has. But it's saying profile suggests, meaning it's possible that his profile is inaccurate. He took the test and the picture that it kind of gives of him isn't quite right. For whatever reason, the questions didn't totally sample or didn't totally get at what he's really experiencing. So it's okay to have a healthy degree of skepticism here in terms of how valid are the test results. You see, at the very last sentence, we also have similar individuals are likely to be given anxiety and depressive d disorder diagnoses. Again, similar individuals suggest that it's certainly possible that Mr. Anderson has anxiety and depression, but it only if the test uh, profile is valid. And so we say similar individuals are likely, meaning if it is true, if his a profile indicates this, he has anxiety and depression, but it's possible that his profile is invalid. Now, this is important because if we had just written, basically, Mr. Anderson uh, should be given an anxiety and depressive disorder diagnosis, that would be problematic uh, not only for a court of law, which would quest basically put the test results into question, but it would also be potentially harmful for the client because if it isn't true, if those profile results are not accurate, you've essentially made a judgment call on the client prematurely. It's important to note a couple of multicultural issues about the MMPI. I'll say that the MMPI is a valid and reliable test and I've used it clinically and it's quite useful. Um, and I wouldn't discard or dis discredit or not use the MMPI based on having a client who is of a minority group. It's important to note that for African Americans who take this test, who take the MMPI, they tend to score somewhat higher on the scales F, 8, and 9. F, you might remember, is basically in, uh, uh, question items that are uh, uh, infrequently endorsed by people who have genuine problems. And 8 and 9, one is has to do, 8 has to do with schizophrenia, 9 has to do with hypermanic activation. Now, why is that all important? Well, essentially, and I want you, if we kind of talk a little bit about why that might be, it's obvious that if you're African-American or a member of a minority group, you may have actually had some oppression experiences, discrimination experiences, experiences of being, uh, of experienced prejudice. And you may feel, for example, more paranoid as a result of that. Paranoid being, for example, if you say people are out to get me or I, I can't trust people, that may be true. I mean, people may really have been out to get you, or you really do have good reasons for why not to trust people. So in other words, it's a healthy paranoia, right? It's a healthy skepticism because of what's happened to you in the past. And that may explain why some subgroups tend to score higher on these MMPI items than members of a majority group. It's important to note, even with these small differences, that the differences are less than five T-score points and when even when moderator variables ex appear to explain the variance in performance. In other words, we're not talking about huge differences between min m minority groups and majority groups in how they respond to the MMPI, and that's why I think you could use it with minority populations. Okay, take a breath. We've just learned a lot about the MMPI. We're going to close this video lecture by learning briefly about some of the other personality assessments that exist out there that are important to know about even if you don't use them because you may come across testing reports at some point in time that include these instruments. I'm going to go through some of the most common. The first is the Milan instruments. The most common Milan instrument is the Milan Clinical Multiaxial Inventory. This is often abbreviated to the MCMI.
the MCMI only has 175 items less than the MMPI. It's more closely tied to DSM-5 classifications, just DSM classifications in general. And it does detect personality disorders a bit better than the MMPI. So if you're looking for a test for personality disorders, Milan is known to be a kind of uh, hot shot in, in that field. He's known for being one of the main uh, 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 experts in the field of personality disorders. And so it may, may be worth using the MCMI if, you're, if you want to test specifically for that. Uh, there are some important things to understand, though, about the Milan inventory, such as that if you give a client the Milan, every test result, and I can tell you this from clinical experience, every test result that you get back is going to say the client has either a personality disorder or personality disorder traits or features. Though that means basically sub-threshold, but still they're there. And so if you give that test to a client, you just need to know that it's going to say that and so you don't over pathologize so if that doesn't seem relevant you don't include that in the report I usually don't include features or traits unless I feel like it's really that important because I feel like it's just pathologizing at that point I'm much more likely just indicate a disorder or not a disorder the MCMI to its credit also includes validity scales similar to the MMPI and I should mention that Again, the MMPI was really a purveyor of the way forward here. After the MMPI, a lot of the major psychological tests started to use validity scales, and those are usually the tests that we rely on most. Other available Milan instruments include, there's an adolescent version of the MCMI called the Milan Adolescent Clinical Inventory, or the MACI. There are also these two interesting inventories that Milan developed that are basically not as clinically focused, more about personality styles. So there's this Milan Index of Personality Styles, known as the MIPS, and there's the Milan Adolescent Personality Inventory, the MAPI. In my experience, those are used much less commonly because they don't have as much clinical focus, and usually clinicians just don't tend to be that interested in evaluating personality styles. They're much more interested in evaluating whether or not someone has a diagnosis or not. Next is the Personality Assessment Inventory. The, this inventory has 344 items selected from an original item pool of 2,200 items, so they had uh, some good degree of discrimination in terms of what items fit in this inventory and which did not. Similarly to the MMPI, the MCMI does have validity scales. Differently than the MMPI, it has a four-point Likert scale for scoring, so it's not true-false. It's not at all true, slightly true, mainly true, and very true. Now we have, we're going to explore a little bit, some measures of healthy individuals, what we call normal personality. Again, these are less commonly used in my experience in clinical settings because they don't give you a diagnosis. We have the California Psychological Inventory. This is kind of an interesting one because 33% of its items were taken from the MMPI. So they just took, I guess, the ones that they were trying to sample in terms of healthy personality. Again, it's used with well-adjusted individuals, usually in college counseling centers. It's used to assess strengths rather than just weaknesses. And it has 434 items. A shorter version has 260 items. It's pretty comprehensive still. Then we have the Tennessee Self-Concept Scale, which is about a person's you know, belief or thoughts about themselves. And then we have the child version, which is called the Piers-Harris Children's Self-Concept Scale. And then, of course, we have some other instruments which are very commonly used by counselors, such as the Myers-Briggs. And the Myers-Briggs, of course, you'll learn more about in your career development class. It's very important to understand the Myers-Briggs just because it's so commonly used in the field. And I have clients to this day who know their Myers-Briggs code and can talk quite articulately about it. Uh, and want to talk about it, so you really should understand the Myers-Briggs and its codes if you're working with clients, even outside of career contexts. Okay, there's one uh, group of tests that's very important for us to talk about uh, because of the way in which we now understand these tests and the way they were presented initially. What do I mean? I think you should be careful about assessments that claim to measure, and this is a quote, consistent and enduring personality traits, consistent and enduring. In other words, personality over the lifespan. 
One example of this is the Big Five. The Big Five, you may remember if you've taken undergraduate psychology, the OCEAN model, O-C-E-A-N. OCEAN stands for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. There are five big domains of personality that they claim to have found um, uh, empirically. There are two major big personality inventories that use the Big Five as their template. One is the NEO and another is the 16PF. Now here's why we should be careful about using things like the NEO and the 16PF. The five factors, the ocean model, is not as consistent as we have been led to believe. Remember when it was talked about before, it was talked about as you have, if you take the ocean, uh, test or one of the NEO or 16PF kinds of tests, you're going to get a personality style or type that is going to be consistent for you throughout the rest of your life. And what they found is that uh, all test administrations are events in time and should not be considered definitive longitudinal findings because we change as humans. So therefore it's more preferable to measure personality states, not traits. The graphs in front of you explain this. These are, this is from a study by, I'm going to butcher the name, Srivatislava, John and Gosling, that looked at the big five traits and how consistent they are longitudinally over the course of a person's lifespan. The very bottom of each of those graphs, the x-axis, has age, beginning with early adulthood, 20s, early 20s, and ending with late adulthood, so that would be mid to late 80s, okay? Actually, I think it's about 60. I think it runs from 21 to 60. I apologize. And the y-axis gives you a range for basically scores how much of these constructs exist in each of those age groups. Okay, so take a look at some of these correlational charts. For conscientiousness, what do you see? You see that for both men and women, that over time we become more conscientious. So in other words, uh, you know, less play, more <laughs> serious uh, in how we approach life, more reliable perhaps. Agreeableness, let's look at that next. You see kind of a waveform design, but by and large there's this kind of increase that happens for both men and women over time, meaning we become more agreeable as people over time. In terms of neuroticism, this one's very interesting. It's hard to, to di differentiate the two lines uh, from just looking at the PowerPoint, but the top line I can tell you is women. And women for neuroticism uh, decrease gradually and consistently over time so that older women are far less neurotic than younger women. And if you look at men, it's about s somewhat consistent over time that there's more variability as a person ages and grows older. So neuroticism definitely does not stay the same over time. Openness, you also see somewhat, unfortunately for us, of uh, the, the older you get, the less open you are, to some degree. There's a somewhat of a reduction in openness over time. We tend to get set in our ways, I guess, uh, tend to have had experiences which inform the way we see the world, and we're less open to reappraising those. And then we have extroversion, and that's the very bottom graphic, the bottom left. And extroversion you notice that women decrease slightly over time, very slightly, men increase slightly over time. That one is probably the most consistent of all of the f five graphs that you see in front of us, extroversion. Maybe openness too, but extroversion certainly. So what we can glean from this, from looking at these graphs, is that it is not true that people remain consistent over time in terms of their personality. In fact, most of us, our personality changes and evolves over time. So interpret the five factor tests with caution. Okay, I have one last personality assessment to talk to you about. It's been a long video lecture. I'm grateful that you've been able to stick with it. The sentence completion test is, is an example of a projective test. So in a way, it doesn't really fit with some of the others, but it's important to talk about here just because of I want to be able to have a comparison with a projective test. So you get a sense for how they measure personality differently. A sentence completion test is a fill-in-the-blanks test that's used to explore the client's inner world. While projective assessment tools should not be used to formally diagnose or assess, they can be helpful in providing a richer understanding of objective assessment findings.
One example is the sentence completion test, and the most famous version of this is Rotter's Incomplete Sentence Bank. As with most projective tests, we don't have reliability information, meaning it's very possible that you give two very different versions of the sentence completion test depending on which client you have. And in fact, clinicians will make up their own sentence completion tests for different uh, uses for different clients, different populations. It's a non-standardized instrument, and that means it doesn't have normal criterion referenced uh, uh, information about reliability and validity. We're not sure entirely how to score it or interpret it. It's really based on clinical skill when you interpret sentence completion tests. Now they're useful because often you get the client's own voice rather than true, false, or Likert scales for how they respond to certain question items about personality. And when you use them concurrently as part of a test battery with something that's more objective, such as the MMPI, it can help to explain and can work together quite well in giving you a more holistic picture of, of the client's personal functioning, personality functioning. So that gives you an idea about projective testing and how it is useful and also how it's different from objective personality assessment. These are the references for what we talked about in this lecture today. I thank you for sticking with it. This concludes this video lecture.